Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode where we're going to be talking about product security and getting a good understanding of what that is. And to help us walk through that, we have Megan Sanford, and she is the Vice President, Chief Product Security Officer, Energy Management at Snyder Electric. So welcome, Megan. Hi, thanks so much, Chris. I'm excited to, to talk with you today, and I'm looking forward to this one because this is not really a topic that that I'm that well versed in. So hopefully, we'll, you'll you'll bring me up as well and as as well as our listeners. So, so maybe get us started just for pro- what is product security for the people who who haven't heard that terminology before. Sure, in its most basic way, uh, we'll talk about product security from two different lenses. The first one is product security is often referred to as it relates to the secure development life cycle of a product and or system, which means that the testing and the design, secure by design, the items that go into ensuring that a product is made and tested in a secure way before it goes to market to live in a customer environment. So you may have heard of things like penetration testing, which is normally done towards the end of a secure development cycle. Towards the beginning, you may have heard of things like secure reference architectures, code reviews, static analysis scanning, dynamic analysis scanning, source code analysis. It's really designing security into the product and safety, I might add, into the product from the very get-go to ensure that the end result is a product that is being shipped with the most capability in it in order to ensure that it's going to be fit for function and meet the needs of the environment that it's going to live in. The second part of that is the actual product security features. These are things like uh, secure boot, runtime protection, the utilization of trusted platform modules, other tools that can be used to ensure that security is baked in and that the security that's baked into the product can be interoperable and communicate in an effective and secure way with other devices that are living in that environment. So you may think of things like certificate authority as a really good example of something that needs to communicate northbound and southbound from the product throughout the system. And you have several checks in there to basically validate Is this the product that it says it is? Are there checks and balances? Can the system validate that? Do you have good cyber hygiene, as people may call it, in terms of not utilizing default passwords or hard-coded passwords? In some cases, you do have default passwords, but for example, the manufacturer may have you change that on a PLC after it's commissioned and the right people log in and, and things like that are set up. You also have capabilities like event logging, which means that when something is communicating with the device, that there are proper logs in there that say what the product was talking to, uh, proper time stamping. And that helps you in the case of, say, someone, you know, unfortunately hacks your network or gets down to the OT layer and starts trying to do weird things or um, unauthorized things to that PLC, that PLC will have a record, a log, and a timestamp recording that type of activity. So again, you can decompose product security into the processes by which products are made and tested in a secure way. And then actual product security features that should be considered and baked into the product before it ships. Got you. Okay. That helped a lot. Now you mentioned something about OT level. So typically from a product security standpoint, are we working at that level and down from the devices? Yes. Traditionally, I would say yes. You're talking about kind of level five of the traditional Purdue model down to level zero, which is the sensor and asset level. However, 
the world's changing a bit, right? And that now you you see cases where that OT and the enterprise IT network are talking more. You see things like more utilization of the cloud, both on-prem within the OT environment, as well as maybe connecting up to, to an Amazon or a Microsoft Azure instance, because customers, it's 2020, they're they're living in the present and they know that a lot of this big iron and a lot of their OT networks are producing tremendous and valuable data for them every day. And up until a few years ago, there weren't great mechanisms to necessarily do much with that data. But today you can utilize the kind of computing capacity of the cloud to make better sense of the data that you have to drive better decision making, to understand what What's the big iron? What's this turbine telling us? Or what's this plant floor telling us, right? Is it telling us that, you know, we should probably go down in a few months for maintenance because some equipment is not producing good data or the sensors are experiencing drift problems? The the data from these environments is very useful. People are definitely interested in utilizing it. So, A few years ago, I think we traditionally talked about it in terms of level zero through five, but now that's, it's somewhat changing. And I, and I think that it's a positive thing as long as it can be done in a safe and secure way. Exactly. No doubt. I mean, so we've talked a lot on EcoSY about cybersecurity and that we're dealing outsiders getting in down through the, the business network onto the OT uh, so you're seeing, I guess, that bridge is migrating migrating up to the cloud. I guess, are the product security engineers working more with the cybersecurity engineers as well? Oh, definitely. I think that that's been happening for a few years. You hear people talk a lot about this whole thing around OT and IT convergence. Well, I'm, that's been actually happening for years now, but I think that the terminology has become more mainstream, but absolutely the the IT and the cyber side of the house and things like application security within the cloud and then securing that pipeline down to your OT assets, those conversations, they've been happening. And in many cases, they're actually being realized in a really positive way within customer environments. Got you. That was great. I mean, you really unpacked a lot for us, getting us started to, for that basic understanding. So, you know, how'd you get into this field, Megan? I got into it by accident, I would say. <laughs> so th- it's a it's a pretty cool story, actually. So I had been working in the Virginia governor's office for a few years, really focused on traditional critical infrastructure protection, which is guns, guards, gates, the study of, you know, terrorism. You know, this was kind of a few years after 9-11. I was working in the office, like right as I graduated college. I did that work and I loved it. And I I got into a niche area of writing response plans, right, and coordinating that amongst, you know, tons of government entities, localities, um, private sector, you name it. And I met a few people that worked in cybersecurity at General Electric. And there was one gentleman, Corey Jackson, and he was trying to build up his team at GE. And he had a role open for someone to specialize in leading product security incident response For all of GE, I mean, really cool job, like dream job that people would would think about an opportunity like that. And Corey kept emailing me and he was like, hey, I really want you to apply for this role that I have open. And I was like, Corey, I said, like, I'm a traditional security person, like I'm a homeland security, you know, type specialist. I, I, I know about a little bit about cyber, I'd say. I mean, I had taken classes in grad school on cyber and I could kind of navigate my way around a conversation, but I wasn't an expert by any sense of the imagination. And he kept saying, no, just go for it, just apply. And he was like, you have response skills, you know how to write response plans, you know how to bring people together, you know, you've got positive attitude, you know, you're a nice person to work with. And that that's really what we need more than anything is somebody that can bring people together across the businesses and the organization to help form these plans. And he said, just apply. So I did. And he said, we can teach you cyber. And I mean, that's pretty much exactly what they did. Long story short is that I ended up applying. I I went through the whole interview panel thing. And I I was really honest. I said, I'm not, I'm probably not as strong on cyber as some of your other candidates are going to be. But at the end of the day, I think that my experience in Homeland Security and the response planning aspect and 
understanding how to bring people together in functions is what interested them in me as a candidate. And so I, I came on board, it was definitely uh, drinking from the water hose. I mean, I know that's such a cliche term, but it really was, especially in a large company like GE, but it was just an awesome experience. And I kind of dove in and, and learned different skills like penetration testing, working on a blue team, um, got great experience there. And I was really surrounded by people, quite frankly, a lot smarter than I was. And so I was always trying to come into the office every morning, like, all right, like I've got to be prepared. I've got to study on this. Like I've got to be ready for this meeting. And so I pushed myself really hard uh, the first three years getting into cyber, but eventually I, I knew enough to where I studied for my certified ethical hacker certification and my certified uh, hacking forensic investigator certificate as well. And I mean, I guess at the end of the day, uh, the rest is history. Well, that is awesome. And that's a great, great story. I mean, hats off to you. And, and I feel your, your pain. I'm surrounded by smarter people all the time and it can be intimidating, but you put in the work and you got there and that's awesome. So very happy for you. And for this field in particular, Megan, do you see any trends or, or anything out there that you're seeing for the future? Yeah, absolutely, Chris. So what I tell people a lot is that 15, 20 years ago, cyber really became mainstream where everybody started talking about it. You know, you had the big 2000 scare and, and all that and chief information security officers, CISOs, you know, as everyone calls them, they really became forefront and all the major Fortune 500 companies were hiring them. They couldn't find CISOs quickly enough. They couldn't find the people with the right skill sets quickly enough. They brought the people on board. And I mean, these folks really had a light shown on them for many, 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 many years. And they had resources and funding and lots of things given to them that quite frankly, absolutely should have been. That was absolutely the right move. It happened at the right time. And you really saw the market forces compelling that movement. And I absolutely think that that's kind of the, when we talk about the story of product security, and what I'm going to mention about chief product security officers, it was really the trend and evolution of how chief information security officers developed that opened the door for chief product security officers. And the trend that I predict is that just like every major Fortune 500 has a CISO today, in five or 10 years, I guarantee you that every major Fortune 500 is going to have a chief product security officer. And the way that I kind of separate the two roles, and some companies um, have dual hats, meaning that you have a CISO that's also carrying the function and responsibility for the chief product security officer role. The CISOs really are best poised to protect that enterprise network the enterprise governance, risk, and compliance programs, everything that falls underneath that, right? Kind of the, the ISO side of the house, the SOX compliance, they handle hundreds of stuff. They have big enough programs unto themselves, and any one of them will tell you that any day of the week. And on the product side, the products are really what the company sells, what makes the company money. And therefore, you really, and this is my opinion, you really want someone that can just focus on that because, again, Product security is a big enough domain unto itself that it can easily stand alone. And not someone that's going to be a big influencer role that's going to be working directly with your development teams to do the two main things that I talked about in the beginning of the conversation, which is making sure that the way that you develop products in a secure way is up to par. And if you can, kind of leapfrogging your competitors to give you that differentiation and secondly, the features that you choose to invest, to insert into your product are, again, what's going to give you that market differentiation. And from a customer standpoint, say, if I have two PLCs that are pretty like in capability and function, and they're pretty like and comparable in terms of pricing, you're probably going to want to go with the one that you know has more security features baked in. And so that's really at the heart of what I'm getting at is that Chief product security officers can be a force for pushing the market. They can be a force for delighting your customers, of impressing your customers, and demonstrating to them that you take security seriously and you've invested in someone to lead that function for you and ensure that the job gets done. 
Right. Absolutely. I mean, it, it makes total sense too. I mean, to, to split it up because the responsibility is so large. Uh, and if you focus, like you said, on that secure development and the feature selection, that's a full-time role, you know, with a team of engineers and people to, to really enhance the product offering. So from the other side of the house with, with the chief information security officers, they have a lot on their plates too. So it totally makes sense to, to break those apart and you're seeing the future correctly. And I'll probably make another prediction that you will be holding that role of chief product security officer. It, it is, it's coming. So if you were to look for our industrial listeners out there and they're trying to, to understand maybe some of the tactics that hackers are taking, what would some of them be that people that are trying to get into these controllers now from a product standpoint? So, and this is kind of a scary thing, but the easiest way if I were to kind of put my red team hat on, if I were to utilize that certified ethical hacking certificate that I have, if I were to go in and do an assessment on a customer environment, the first thing I would look for would I would do a network scan of basically that customer's environment from a tool like Shodan. And I would try to find devices that were directly exposed on the internet at that customer site. InMap is another tool that you can easily do within your environment as long as you do a passive InMap scan because you don't want to knock products off your network. In reality, I guess I should caveat this by saying that unless you really have someone that's know what, that knows what they're doing, you shouldn't be playing around with your OT network. And I don't think that any customers out there are going to be jumping on Shodan or InMap to, to run these scans. But the point that I'm trying to make is that Hackers can see what you have directly exposed on the internet, and they will essentially go and knock on the front door of that device. And once they figure out what they have, whether it's an HMI or a PLC, they will look on National Vulnerability Database to see what vulnerabilities may be present in those products. And then they'll just go to town exploiting the publicly known vulnerabilities because in many cases, if you're a customer that may have products directly exposed to the internet and you don't know about it, it's also a good likelihood that you have patches that need applying in that network that either you didn't know about or you haven't gone on shutdown yet to apply the patches and so they haven't been fixed. But that's kind of the the easy kind of newbie hacker way that any, any person with even a, a minimum amount of hacking experience, that, that's what they're going to do. Uh, more sophisticated hackers, they will get into the enterprise network via like a phishing email or all of us have heard of those nightmare stories of what companies are dealing with where somebody will get an email and they'll think it's a well-intentioned thing. They won't think too much of it and they'll click on a link within the email and then, you know, kind of the bad guys, the hackers or maybe what we refer to as the ad advanced persistent threats, which are nation state attackers. They will basically install a kit on your computer, maybe a remote access tool, also known as a rat or something else, some type of automated malware, even something that could be even more nefarious and targeted. And they will eventually move throughout your network, get the files that they want. And if they're after the OT network, if they want to shut down your plant floor or lock up your devices or maybe infect it with ransomware, whatever their motivation may be they can move laterally down from the IT network into the OT network. And that's really what we see a lot of is that the barrier between the IT and the OT networks are still very porous. They're not properly segmented. They don't have proper intrusion detection systems on them. And so the attacker is able to move laterally down. And if I'm an attacker, the number one product that I'm going towards is the HMI workstation because that workstation is going to, pretty much give me all the information I want to know on the different PLCs and devices that are talking to it, right? And so from there, I can move eastbound or westbound or northbound or southbound. That's kind of my beachhead to do whatever else I want to do. And so having things in place like secure encrypted protocols, pri proper uh, micro segmentation in the OT network, and just generally visibility of knowing who is talking to what and if you see something on your network or you have an IDS that's going to tell you if there is abnormal uh, communication and activity, being alerted to that quickly 
is what's really, really going to help you at the end of the day. Right. Okay. So I kind of heard two levels there. You have that passive scanning of the network, as you were talking about the show and the NMAP. But then when the more advanced, when they get in through, I think you were saying like the, the remote access tools where they're actually getting into, they're putting that rat in place. That's where they can bridge and get into your OT and make those decisions. Um, that's very interesting. So the so you're seeing the HMIs as being the, the main point of, of attack to get because then you can go anywhere from there. Yes. If you look at the incidents that have become public when companies have been breached, unfortunately, the HMI is always pretty much a jump to other devices unless those other devices are directly exposed to the internet, in which case, you know, they probably don't need to go through the HMI to access it. Right. So there may be that maintenance manager or that engineer right now listening, Megan, that's panicking a little bit based off this conversation. He says, I got a lot of HMI panels on my production floor. You've mentioned a few tips. Where could they go uh, and, and start enhancing their position? Sure. I mean, I I think the main thing that I would want to know if I were in their shoes was, do I have anything directly exposed to the internet? Is anything that I have communicating directly out to the internet? And like I said, I'm not recommending that people, if they're not comfortable and they don't have authorization to do that on their network, I, I do not want you to go out there and try to do that on your own. I want you to get in contact with your vendor, with other cybersecurity consulting companies. Clarity is a partner organization of my current company. They're very well known for for doing work like this. There are plenty of others out there if you do a quick Google search and ask your community friends or others within your company that may be on your cybersecurity team. Tell them that this is the concern that you have and you would like someone to, to tell you if you have products directly exposed and once they determine what that exposure is, then of course, get them off the internet. And from there, I I tell folks there's a few different things. I'm really big on talking up about asset inventories. Know what you have. You can't protect something if you don't know that it's there. That's kind of the big thing, number one. Secondly, have proper segmentation between your network so that you're making it harder for attackers to be able to move around in your environment if they get in. Third is the intrusion detection system. Again, Clarity is a company that does a really good job of providing this today. They're out of Israel. Once you are able to know if someone has breached your network and they're moving around, the quicker you're able to get that alert and then take action on it, the quicker you're able to kick those bad guys out, figure out how they got in, and then patch that hole. So I, I hope that's helpful uh, kind of in a, in a quick rundown of if, it, if I were in their shoes, what, what I would probably be doing. With you. That's great. Understanding the inventory, having that good segmentation between the networks, and then having that detection system in place. All great tips. So, you know, Megan, the, the industrial environment's changing, and a lot of people are trying to do stuff remote now and with the whole work from home, things like that. It, it's hitting the plant floor. So there are more and more tunnels to get into these plants. So how has that changed the complexity of product security? So it's kind of a popular phrase that you're going to hear a lot lately and that the home network has now become an extension of the corporate network. And that's absolutely true. And there are lots of vendors in the industrial space and pretty much all of them, whichever vendor, you know, you have, if you're a Schneider electric shop, if you're a, Eaton shop, if you're a semen shop or a Rockwell automation shop, all of them have some type of remote access and connectivity tool that they can provide to you. Definitely give them a call, have the conversation, be very deliberate, you know, ask good questions, do your own research and figure out what's going to be the best option for your site and go from there. Very good. Good advice. So you may have people listening, Megan, too, that want to learn more or maybe want to start studying. Are there any governing bodies or or areas of uh, resources that you would recommend or you would point people to so they can get up to speed on these types of threats to security? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a free course that I, I love recommending to people because I think it's really solid. It's free and it's really geared towards asset owners and operators. I took this course maybe five or six years ago. It's out in Idaho at Idaho National Labs, but 
if you Google Department of Homeland Security, CISA, C-I-S-A, is kind of the new agency rebranding, but it's always, I still kind of refer to it as ICS CERT. It's the same deal. It's ICS CERT sits within the Cybersecurity uh, Infrastructure Security Agency. I think that's what CISA stands for. If any CISA people are listening and I got that wrong, I'm sorry. But that's what you Google. And you can look for the ICS 301 course. And that is a five-day in-person course out at Idaho National Labs. And they will walk you through everything that I just mentioned, except they'll probably do it better than I did. And every day you'll learn something new and they give you workbooks from which you can study and take home. And at the end of the course, they actually put you in a live simulation where you are trying to defend an OT network from an attack. And so you learn about looking at the traffic using tools like Ida Pro that are coming along. You learn how to use tools like Nmap to see, all right, what's on this network? What is it talking to? What do I think this device is? You learn all of that stuff. And it's done in a way, and the instructors are really cool. They're nice people. They're very laid back. It was helpful to me in that they didn't talk above me, if that makes sense. Like they spoke to me and they taught me um, just using kind of plain common day English in a way that I could understand at the time so that I didn't feel intimidated by the subject matter. It was very relaxed. They walked me through. It was just done in a really low stress environment. And that, that helped me kind of get through the material and learn it and take notes in a way that I didn't feel like I was being rushed or anything like that. And, and they were there. I will say, you know, with everything going on with COVID, they may have some virtual options now, but I have heard that has been a priority for them is opening up more seats in that class. I think it's normally around I'd say between 45 and 60 people that can get into that course every two weeks or something like that. Don't quote me on that because it's been a few years, but just for a general idea, I always recommend the ICS 301 course. That's awesome. And what we can do, Megan, too, we'll we'll link that in our show notes for our listeners. So if you want to check it out and go straight to it, we'll get the link. We'll have it there. Uh, You can go learn more about it. It sounds like an awesome course. I mean, I, I can't imagine the the lab at the end sounds like Megan, if I, if I went, I probably want you to go so I can look on, look on your paper, you know, uh, I'm not sure if I can pass that on my own, but outside of that. So are there any degrees, somebody's in college or if they're thinking about going back just for a bachelor's, does anything line up specifically for this industry better than others? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I see, I see a little bit of everything within people that are working in product security and industrial control system security, it's still kind of so new that you don't see people coming out of college with a degree in ICS security. I think that there are a handful of programs out there that are popping up, which is really cool, but I see a ton of people with electrical engineering degrees, okay, that then just get into ICS security because they know their way around a plant floor and they get interested or they hear a podcast like this and they're like, man, you know, I'd like to like to do a little bit of research on the side. And then maybe within their company, they see if there's an opportunity for them to do like a stretch role or mentor under someone in cyber. And that's a lot of the career paths that I see so far then you have people with computer science degrees that end up learning a bit about OT networks and industrial control systems, SCADA, and they go in from that way. So that's what I see most common. But I can tell you that if you have any college degree, or even if you don't have a college degree, there are a few different certifications that are coming out. I mentioned the Certified Ethical Hacker. There's the CISSP. That's very common. I think there's the GICSP, which is one specifically geared towards industrial control system security. I see that one popping up a lot. So there are different ways. I think the main thing for me is that this is such an in-demand area that if you work for a company that may have an interest in improving the number of people they have working this or the capability in general, just talk to them and say, hey, like what what are my options? Could I begin studying this? If they would pay for any training or help you along the way or get you started, just having an interest in getting started. And then secondly, I'd say, 
going to conferences like the big S4 conference, uh, Dale Peterson's conference in Miami every year. There's a big one in Atlanta in the fall time frame. This is just a, a great way to network, to kind of begin to understand the presentations. Uh, actually, going, kind of going back to Dale Peterson real quick, it's really generous and it's nice of him, but he posts all of the presentations from his annual conference on YouTube. It's the S4, uh, S4 events channel. And so if you wanted to see all of the presentations from last January, uh, he has them posted. I even did a presentation there around using the incident command system for industrial control systems response. So um, really cool stuff. And those folks, again, they're really smart. You've got people in there like Chris Sistrunk from Mandiant that has been doing incident response for many years now. Definitely experts, definitely very interesting content. Definitely check that out. That is awesome. Definitely want to check some of those resources out. The cool part about it, Megan, it sounds like there's just so many different ways to get into this industry in this this area. So the sky's the limit. So if you're a listener, take some of Megan's advice, check out some of these resources and just start, get going. I mean, it's, it's really an interesting field. And like she she also mentioned, a lot of security in your future as well. This, will, this is definitely something that's going to be needed for quite a long time. So Megan, we love to wrap up Eco Ask Why with the why talking about the purpose so if you had to boil this topic down what would it be i think it's kind of like life everything's about connection right and the world that we live in is becoming more and more connected every day so i often hear people say you know i don't i don't care about how different things work or i don't care about politics or i don't care about the government or this and that to me that's kind of like saying i don't care about understanding how the world works around me So I think that product security is kind of like that, is that it's going on around you, whether or not you care about it or not, but it's becoming more and more a part of our daily life. And I'll give you an example. I mean, my my kindergartner, we're still working on his ABCs and writing his name down and stuff like that, but he has a little tablet and he knows a nine character password to get into the tablet. And so when we talk about it's happening around us, whether we want it to or not, a kindergartner understands how to use a password before they can say their ABCs, you know, that's so telling to me. And so I think getting in front of it uh, where security is just taught, just like having a lock on your house, understanding how to have proper passwords on your routers and protecting your children and, you know, what they're able to view from these tablets. I think that's huge. And when we talk about product security in the context of industrials, it's an even bigger issue. So I, that's the way I see it, at least. So that that's the why from my perspective. And that's a wonderful why. And Megan, thank you so much. You've, you've unpacked so much information and insight for our listeners through this topic. Fun conversation. And we really appreciate you taking the time with us here today on EcoSY. Thank you so much. It was awesome. Thank you for listening to EcoSY. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.